What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Best Books Podcast, an Orchard Hill Church podcast that helps you choose your next book. In this world, there are so many different books you could read and, and not enough time to do it. There's only 24 hours in a day, and we want to give you the best possible books to help you in your journey of following Christ. Welcome to the show today to our, our guest for Episode 7. He's a musician, a basketball player, and everything in between. <laughs> Welcome to the show, David Bowens. David, how's it going? I mean, all is well, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We, oh, were just, uh, we were just talking about basketball a little bit. Um, how long have you been playing? Are you? Uh, did you play like growing up, or is that just like a casual thing? I played super casual as a kid. wasn't really good at it. I just was an athletic kid, but I spent so much time in church that we weren't really. We didn't yeah. get a chance to do a whole lot of extracurricular sports. But um, I actually really took to the sport like after leaving home, coming to Pittsburgh. As an adult, I started playing it and started to get it. So it just made a lot. So it's been way more fun in yeah. the later years. But of course. As that has gotten, as my mind has gotten better around the game, my body has gotten worse. Yeah, <laughs> so, totally. So I've I've mentally understand the game more with no ability to play it. How my mind actually get, gets yeah. it. So yeah. there's a confliction there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> would you say that um, when you think about music versus basketball, would you say music is still something you you love more? Or is it a little bit different when it's something you do as a part of your job? I think basketball is just pure fun. Yeah. Right? There's, there's no like true heavy obligation to it, or, and it doesn't come with any uh, weight. Yeah. Whereas uh, I think the music, because I do music and ministry, it carries a certain weight that is, one, enjoyable, but there is a different focus and intention to uh, impact. So it does carry a weight that um, if I am not minding my, my, my soul and my spirit in the context of the Word of God and spending time seeking the Lord, I, it can become a burden if I'm not engaging it in a way that I think honors honors God best. So yeah, yeah, no, that's fascinating. I'm sure the way you approach music is is even different than someone who is a musician in, in more of the secular world, secular music. But they're music probably industry. better than me, <laughs> like in terms of just the music ability. And mine comes with a, a couple of uh, other layers, with you know, like the sure. gospel and that content with it. But mm. they are probably far better just flat out musicians. So. Sure, sure. Hey, no shame in that. Though. No shame <laughs> in that. Well, tell us a little bit, bit about yourself. Tell us about your family. What does a day off look like in the in the Bowens household? Well, I, I am married to the amazing Tamika. She is uh, an angel in my home. Mm -hmm. uh, we have five children, and a day off for me is probably. I mean, it's, I don't know that it's. Is it really off when you have? Seven people. In the house? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but a day off. I mean, it could be. A, it could be just after work. It doesn't necessarily have to be a day off. But one of the things we really like to do is like we'll do like a family movie night where mm -hmm. we get like all our snacks together. We can even. This is the one day that we let them eat their dinner in the living room or yeah. something. And we pick a movie that everybody can watch and just spend time watching that. Or we might play a video, not a video game, but I play a, um, a board game together, like apples to apples or what do you mean? Those things that are just. We laughing and saying silly things and mm -hmm. trying to, you know, pick cards that fit with this meme and just laughing at each other and having a good time, just kind of hanging out. Sometimes sure. do you guys have a you guys have a favorite? Is the what do you mean? What do you mean is one. Apples to apples is another one. Those are two that I think we play a lot because it's just easy for any age to play mm -hmm. and engage. Um, so there's no like age issue of, you know, everybody can play from our seven year old to seventeen year old to my ancient self. So right. you know, it's a uh, it's a good time. You know, I'm not a big fan of the board games, but I notice how everyone else loves it, so I, I oblige. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know? totally. That's Absolutely. Your that's your sacrifice. That's, well, we already <laughs> that's talked, my sacrifice. We already talked a little bit about music and, and ministry, but yeah, just tell us just generally about your, your area of ministry. What do you enjoy most about your role? I think the people. Um, while I know in ministry it can be, people can sometimes be hard, I've been mm -hmm. genuinely blessed to work with and to engage with just some amazing people, man, from the volunteers to the staff even. Uh, it's just been a gift and a blessing to grow and to learn, to pour into and to be encouraged by um, just engaging with the people through the context of the gospel in music and sometimes just through the word of God and, and just being together and so, and just experiencing life uh, in close proximity with other people. I've been able to really grow um, and learn and, and see really God just do beautiful things through the context of ministry and music from the staff to volunteers to just all we get to engage with. So the people have really, uh, it's been a blessing to engage with the people in a multitude of uh, 
facets and perspectives for sure. Totally, and and I think your role is more unique than anyone else we've had on so far because everyone so far has just only known Wexford people. Oh, yeah, but you have a unique place. perspective <laughs> in that. Yeah, you you are primarily down in the strip, but you're yeah. you're up here, you know, quite a bit um, mm -hmm. doing stuff like this and, and leading different. Uh, groups in worship. So, talk to us about that. What, what, what's it like, sort of leading primarily at a at, at a camp, at a campus versus you know, or, or at a at a campus that isn't isn't Wexford? You know, it's interesting. I think it's funny because you would think like when you came to the bigger place that it would be like harder, like mm -hmm. you have more things to do. Sure. But actually, the smaller place requires a lot more of me sure. than me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, more hats to wear. Way more sure, hats. Yeah. Way more hats. Um, and, and, and so, but it has also allowed me to learn a lot more and to mm -hmm. develop a lot more skill sets that, um, that I probably wouldn't have had to uh, being up here. But it's also just a lot of fun. You know, we get a lot of young adults down there, a yeah. lot of young, young professionals. Uh, college grad students seem to really like our space a lot more than sometimes even the younger college students. Like younger college students, like, like maybe something a little different, but mm -hmm. we're getting a lot, a lot of college grad students. We do get college students, but mostly our room was filled with young professionals, uh, young singles and young families, which is really cool to be able to see people kind of starting their life out and new yeah. careers, people coming from other cities. Um, it's been really beautiful um, connecting and engaging in that community in that way. Uh, to even be able to uh, function somewhat pastorally down there as mm -hmm. well um, through getting opportunity to teach as well as um, just being intentional about helping to engage and build relationships with the young men in the community as well. So yeah. it's been a really uh, growing season for me, but an awesome time to see what God is doing in the lives of people for sure. Yeah, I'd imagine that age is an interesting dynamic because you come here and you're median average age person, you mm -hmm. know, being here, being a little bit more established, having a family, whereas yeah. I'm sure you go down to the strip and you're one of the old heads, man. I you're, really am. You're, you're, uh, I you're, tell them how old I am and they'd be like, woo, I'd be like, listen, I'm not about to die yet. Slow down. Yeah, you know? yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Ease up. But, don't, don't react that way. That's, <laughs> that's offensive. Yeah. I know, right? I was yeah. like, we didn't think you were that old. Well, my knees remind me every yeah, day. <laughs> yeah, Totally. Well, thanks for allowing us to, to get to know you a little bit. Absolutely. Um, today, Dave and I were talking about the book uh, Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. This has mm -hmm. been a book that's been on my list for a while. I think if you've been around the church, you've you've heard of the book. You don't really know what it's about. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear letters to the church, and you're like, is it a is it a study on Revelation? Because that's kind yeah. of what it what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, but I I just went in completely blind, and I I, I found that I really enjoyed it. But mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a timely book, and that yeah. like you you couldn't just drop this book 50 years ago. It wouldn't have made any sense. It's mm -hmm. it's a book that Francis Chan is writing about his experiences leading churches and just how we can sort of really change and, and, and reform as, as, yeah. as, as churches. And um, I don't know if it's fair to say, I'd say it's largely a rebuke of the way of, you know, with the way church happens in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really impossible to talk about this book without talking about the author because it is, it's more autobiographical than, yeah. than any book that I've read recently. So, you know, what can you tell us about the author and maybe his sort of journey and how that's impacted his ministry? Well, it seems like uh, from his perspective, just the experience of being a pastor of a church in America, and then he went and moved his whole family to China mm -hmm. and, and, and wanting to serve there and see what it really meant to be a church in a space where the church is being persecuted and you actually, it, it, could, be, it could be the danger of your life to actually serve Christ and to be a part of a church. And I think that changed his perspective of what the core, the heartbeat of the church should really be. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's not just that, I think he also very clearly states in the book that he just sought the word of God. And I think how he starts the book off is he says, what if you never heard anything about the church and you just looked at the Bible and your only view of what a church is supposed to be was only if you had the Bible, how would you do church? Mm -hmm. And so would it be what it is or would it be something different? And that's kind of how he almost starts off the book when he engages, um, which I thought was just a really interesting way to, to think about it. You know, if you didn't have what you've seen prescribed as church in whatever culture you came from, mm -hmm then uh, how would you do it if all you had was the Bible to view what church should be? And so um, from his experience to China to that, just I think that perspective, looking at the Word of God and seeing what he saw as overwhelmingly clear statements to how the church should gather and engage, um, I think that's why he decided to write this book, yeah. at least from my simple perspective. Yeah, no, I definitely felt that as well. I think 
if nothing else, it's a fascinating thought experiment. You know, mm -hmm. just to, if you if you were discipling someone or mentoring someone, just say, hey, if you if all you had was the Bible, you know, what 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 would you change about the church, or what or how would you do church? Yeah, yeah. Um, would, would what's been your journey with this? Have you before reading this book? Would, would do you have times where you think, man, mm -hmm. the way we do church is kind of it's kind of strange? You yeah. know, um, what's been your journey? I think. <clears throat> I would agree in some ways. I think, I mean, growing up in church, I've seen multiple iterations of church. Yeah. There's similarity to, like, there's always been music in every church that I've gone to. Sure. There's always been uh, a message at every church that I've gone to. Um, but after those two things, everything else around it mm -hmm. can be dramatically different. Yeah. Um, there's always music, and even the music within those two things, the presentation of those things could be dramatically different, mm -hmm. which, which I don't think is necessarily wrong, um, but at the same time, uh, so, so I think listening to this book, it really caused me to think of, of just the core things, like listening to it, I was like, well, I mean, this stuff makes sense. And then I looked at and considered even just, just our church, and I was like, yeah, I see, I see how we do those same things in a different format mm -hmm. um, that, that, that allow us to be effective in certain ways um, via like small groups and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, it does, it's something, I think growing up, I did often feel like people often would have this really very highly consumer mm -hmm. perspective of their experience of church. And I always wondered, as I got mature in my faith and understood the Word of God, I always wondered, I was like, how do we change that? I, didn't, I just couldn't figure out. And Because one of the things he said actually in this book is he talks about if you have to be super entertaining and do all these things to keep people, then you'll have to do all those things to, 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 to sustain it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I get that, and I'm like, the hope is, and I can't say it's always been true for everything, because I've definitely seen difference as well. I've seen lives impacted through the way all of these churches that I've been through. I've seen people come to Christ and really change and, and turn to the Lord. So I can't say that they're bad in and of themselves, but I do see how the way we do it can often impact um, and, and create a consumer perspective from, from some people uh, experiencing I say the American church, for, for lack of a better term. Sure, I, and I think that's um, what you're hitting on with that word consumer is really part and parcel is his whole argument. So it'd probably mm -hmm. be helpful to people listening and watching. You know, how would you define that? You know, what, what, is a, what is a consumer mindset? Someone who's, uh, I think when you're experiencing a church is you're coming to solely receive. Mm -hmm. Um, anything you go to, I mean, and any other thing, being a consumer is fine. It makes sense. You know, I'm going to the store to consume, to buy, to get sure. something that I want that benefits me. Um, when The idea of the church is not necessarily for us to come to get what we want to benefit me. The idea, I believe, of the church is to honor God, to gather so that we can set our hearts on Him, to focus on Him, to grow in Him, to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And if your only mindset is to come to just receive so that you can feel better, so that you'll be entertained, so that you will enjoy what happened today and walk away feeling good about yourself, then I think we, we've missed the point mm -hmm. of the intention of the church. Now, I know there are those who have no context for church, so when they show up, sure. they may come with that experience, but the hope is through either time or engagement, they learn that they should come wanting to see what they can give. What can I bring? How can I serve? Because we've all been gifted to impact and for the betterment of the body of Christ. So if that's the case, then what did God give you to add to this body, the church being the body of Christ? And so that's what I really believe when I say, when the consumer, the consumer mindset is, do they have the music I like? Is the preacher who I like is up? Is the, or, or am I coming to, to gather, to be with the body of Christ, to be encouraged, mm -hmm. to, to be spurred on toward love and good deeds so that we would grow encouraging one another to seek the Lord through prayer, through seeking His Word, through growing in our understanding of the Word of God, to worshiping, singing out, and, 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 and blessing His name together. Am I coming to give to the Lord in that moment and be prepared to receive from the Lord, from the Word of God, to understand how I'm supposed to live, to honor Him? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I think, having that, that mindset would help us, I think, more so um, once again, I always know that there are those who walk in our doors who have no context, and so I don't expect that of them, but for those who have been around, for those who have the context of, of what the church should be, know the Word of God to some degree, should be able to understand the importance of coming to give and to be a part of the body, not to just receive. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think the I, I think it's a difficult challenge that really every church Agreed. throughout the years has faced because there there is a sense in which we do come to church to to receive. Absolutely. You know? Um, there's some people like you're saying if you're if you're new to church, man. Like the, the last thing we want to do is make someone feel guilty. Like, hey, man, you're not you're not you're not giving anything back. It's Absolutely. like Phew, I don't even I don't even know if you are my church family yet. Agreed. You know, I even think about our our support groups where it's someone who's been through a divorce, something that's been through something difficult, and they're they're coming because they're like, man, I I feel empty and I mm-hmm. need I need to be poured into. Um, but yeah, I think I think what. I think if you gave that to Francis Chan, you'd probably say, well, that's not the kind of person I'm describing. It's, it, I think what he's saying is, is if we're all coming and we're yeah. just looking at the senior pastor and saying, okay, you give yeah, to give. all of us, mm-hmm. that's kind of a broken environment. And, and I am thankful that we, we do serve at a church where like, we are pretty much always pushing service. We're always trying to, um, to help people understand their place and Absolutely. it's not just a, a, a consumer environment. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I saw is that Chan really loves like the early church. I think mm-hmm. that's something he comes back to a uh, time and time again. And I think his his model and his mind is like, man, if we could just be exactly like the early church, we'd be doing some things right. Um, my my hesitation to that is is in the same way that you can look at other cultures and mm-hmm. say, well, you're different from me, and therefore you're wrong. You can at the same time look at another culture and say, you're different from me, and therefore you're right. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I feel like that's something that Francis Chan does in his book, if I'm being critical. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you, would you agree with that? What, what did you think when you were looking at his, uh, his love for the early church? And I do agree that, that he does have a love for it. And when you say early church, you're talking about from the scriptures, right? Yeah. Not like early church. Not posts. like first couple hundred okay. years. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and so in the terms of the early church, I do agree. He has an immense love. That's very almost clear throughout yeah. just the context of it. But I, what I have to say is he's talking about from the word of God. Though. Right. He's not yeah. speaking from like other books about how they did things. He's speaking out from the word of God, uh, which should carry authority with all of us. Sure. And so for that, I would, I appreciate his immense love of the word of God, you know, mm-hmm. if it was just the early church through the historical perspective of some other context, then I'd be like, okay, I'd wrestle probably, I'd probably be a lot more hesitant if he wasn't reading directly out of the word of God. Mm-hmm. But he's what he's reading from and the prescriptions he's calling from are directly from the word of God. And so I think, I'm not saying that we should just go and overhaul everything and turn everything over and become something different, sure. but we should at the very least wrestle with it because these things live in the context of the scripture. What does that look like? Now, maybe there is a cultural expression of it that's a bit different. I, I, would, I can agree with that fully, mm-hmm. but, but to just, I think I wouldn't toss it out. I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as some, as mm-hmm. some say, um, just be, because of the, the, the love of, of, of another cultural expression of church um, when it's kind of the beginning of what we have for what is the church and what is viewed as the church of the body of Christ. And so um, I do see what you mean by he does have an immense love for the church, what I would agree. Um, I don't know that I feel the same in terms of it just because it's different, mm-hmm. I, uh, you're better. I, and I don't know that I see that mm-hmm. the same in the same way. Sure. I think if, as I've talked to people about the early church, sometimes, sometimes I think we all fall into this temptation to think that they just didn't really have any issues. Oh, and, there was and, obvious issues, yeah. And yeah, so sometimes I, 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 I have to push back on that a little bit. That's and, fair. And help people understand, like, the whole New Testament is, is written in light of their, their sinful issues. people trying yeah. to, trying to uh, field this out. And so there's, Absolutely. there's a level of reverence to where I think we focus on, it's the Word of God, right? Agreed. Um, written by people, and, and, and so we see the messiness, even in the, the series that we've gone through with, like, First and Second Corinthians, mm-hmm. you know, we, we see that. And so... Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks so much for, for your thoughts. One thing I really enjoyed about the way he writes this is um, just his writing style. Mm-hmm. I felt like uh, his humility really comes, up, comes off the page. Mm-hmm. It's, in my mind, it's almost like he doesn't really want to write the book. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like it, he would give anything to be like, man, I, I, wish, I wish I didn't feel this way, but I do. And so I have yeah. to, um, he, he comes across with like very, a very broken heart about mm-hmm. you know, the way the church is and the way he sees the potential for it. Did you get that same kind of Absolutely. gist? He definitely, he, it, yeah, it felt like even just from the very beginning, he was like, I, I didn't want to write this almost. Mm-hmm. It was almost, almost as clear as that. Like he's like, but I, I just felt this, you could tell he had a burden that he felt like he needed to at least express what he sees in the context of the church that he's been experiencing. 
um, here in America, I guess, and um, and he felt called to write, to express, to what he sees, you know. I mean, and the, and the thing, what I always tell people, even I was talking to someone else about the scripture, I was like, listen, man, I was like, there is going to be no perfect church. And I was like, in any church that I go to, it no longer ceases to be perfect because I showed up, <laughs> like, at the end yeah, of the day. Right. So if it was perfect before I got there, it's not now. Yeah. And, and so um, I think we are all in our walk seeking, hopefully, intentionally, to find the best way in which we see God in Scripture, uh, prescribing how we should live as a body of Christ mm -hmm. to honor Him and, and to impact the world for the sake of the gospel. And if that is the case, then we should always be at least willing to, to, to consider is what we're doing the way in which honors God best. Yeah. You know, I think that's a reasonable thing to do if we want to honor God in our lives. And so listening to someone like him who is not being super prideful or just knocking down and abusing the church, mm -hmm. but generally giving sober perspectives in light of scripture on why he sees things a certain way, I think is a reasonable thing to at least wrestle with. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think I, I saw him do that. I, I don't think I've ever seen in any book I've ever written was at the end, he's like, I, what I don't want to happen is to <laughs> write this book and to hear about people have gone to their pastor yep, and yep, said, yep. hey, you got to you got to read this, and or or maybe he would encourage them to read it. But just as far as like making Sorry, it so like you're doing this wrong, you're because, doing this wrong, mm -hmm. making it more of a. a he says it in the first chapter and the last chapter. Yeah, he wants to, yeah. he starts it off like, listen, the worst thing you can do yeah. is go run to your pastor and try to overhaul everything. Right. And he re reaffirms that at the very end again. Yeah. Please don't do this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just telling you what I see in the context of scripture, and as as, as you're called as a leader or as a follower of Christ, uh, you know, respond, I think, as God convicts and engages you. It doesn't mean you got to go and try to change somebody else's church, though, or sure. turn, you know what I mean? And sure. so, Yeah, I think he really respects the way that God has set up the church mm -hmm. in that there are church leaders, and, and it's not, not really the place of us to read some book. And, and even if they're, they're helpful criticisms, yeah. it's not the place of us to just say, well... We need you need to change everything. You moron, how did you not know? I'm so wise, you know. That part, um, that, That's the part about his writing style that I appreciated. He, came, he comes across very very humble and very mm -hmm. um, heartfelt in it. So uh, what, what are some helpful chapters that stick out when you think uh, about this book? For me, I know chapter two, talking about the, the, the sacred mm -hmm. weight that we need to feel about God. I think that, that really stuck with me as I think about this book. But mm -hmm. is there anything that you can think of? Sacred was one, mm -hmm. and uh, the other for me was crucified. Mm -hmm. uh, those two stuck out to me, sacred specifically for that exact thing. I think yeah. um, in the, our nature and our, and our, and I, I would agree with him with this, in our desire to draw more people and to make people comfortable, yeah. we might have changed. I think one of the things he says I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm trying to see if I found my notes, but he said we might have, uh, I don't even know if it was in that chapter actually, but he said we might have lowered the perspective of God like to a whole generation just because of the the proximity, the kind of the message, which is not inaccurate to the scripture in terms that God loves us intimately and wants to be close to us and even kind of the friend of God uh, messaging that we give and, and that, that message that, that allows us to feel the, the nearness, but sometimes not the magnitude of mm -hmm. God and the awesome nature of God. Like one of the things I said to a friend of mine recently was if God literally physically decided to engage earth just from the awesome nature of his size, which he would probably still have to shrink himself to do, mm -hmm. and like his hand were to reach through the sky right now, we would look up, all of us mm -hmm. would be in immense fear mm -hmm. in awe of what is happening. Right. And there will be a day, at least according to scripture, where that will, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That will be the true expression of awe and, and reverence and, and, and that reverential fear that, that the word of God calls us to, that I think, uh, um, we, we, I think we feel like we've lost some of that throughout as time has moved forward. I mean, the Word of God affirms that as time goes on, the, the love of many will wax cold. So that is affirmed in Scripture that that is going to happen. And, and so because of that, you know, I think we have to really consider, like, uh, if that's happening around us, how do we, as the church, still stay grounded and anchored to the, 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 the sacred nature, the, the holiness of God, the, the awe of God, the reverence of Him, so that that thing impacts us on a way that I can remember a time when I was a kid where people wouldn't even spit on the ground of a church, whether they were in Christ or not. Mm -hmm. And I think often that, that communicated something that they just had at the very least a distant respect for what the church was and what it represented, um, which I think that has been lost over time. Mm -hmm. um, 
And some of that can be from just how we, we make people like, hey, man, no, you can talk to God like he's your friend and, and engage him like, you know, be open. And, and, and we kind of build the, um, which once again, I, I don't think it's inaccurate, but I don't think, I think that duality still lives mm -hmm. in that God wants to love us. He's like our father and, and, and wants to have this close and very intimate one-to-one -one relationship with us, yet he is still God. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, the, the phrasing uh, on the, uh, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, where the girl asks about Aslan mm -hmm. and she says, is, is he safe? He said, well, he's good. Mm -hmm. He's not safe. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that perspective of God, is understanding like God is good, mm -hmm. but he's not safe. And so having an understanding of the sacred, holy nature of God that, lean, that, that causes us to have this reverential fear the, to the reality of the massive and powerful nature of God, yet still his love and intentional to us individually is just a powerful thing to try and grasp and live within. But it hopefully gives us a purview or a perspective of ourselves that keeps us humble before the Lord and seeking Him uh, in this life. But, yeah, yeah, I think it's a difficult thing in the Christian life. We're always holding things in, that seem to conflict with one another. We're Absolutely. always holding them in tension. Absolutely. Um, even when you think about the, the omnipotence of God and yet mm -hmm. He wants a relationship with me. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hard to really understand because in our minds we sort of, I think we take mental shortcuts and we stereotype people. Agreed. And so we stereotype God even as Agreed. well. If God is is powerful, if he is mighty, then he must be evil or he must be authoritarian. <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or we think about the the worst person, someone who's, who's held power over us. We think, well, yeah. that, that, that must be who God is like. But the challenge is taking the entire canon of Scripture and, mm -hmm. and, and, and synthesizing it to saying, what what is God's self-revelation in its totality? Mm -hmm. And not just, okay, I'm going to put a lot of weight into this book. I'm going to put a lot of weight Okay. And to where we almost shrink the Bible, where we only kind of talk about the things that we like, and that's that's what I enjoy about preaching, you know, mm -hmm. expositorily. And so we Absolutely. we get the fullness of God, and we get we don't get just the things that are like on the bumper sticker. You Absolutely. Know what I'm saying? Agreed. So I think that's a good transition to talking. We always like to, to bring it back to Orchard Hill Church, seeing that this is an Orchard Hill podcast. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're thinking about people in your ministry, people that you you come across from week to week, um, who who would you say this book is for? What kind of person? What are they uh, thinking through? I think, to be honest with you, I think anyone, staff or lay person, who uh, just has a really sound, solid relationship with the Lord, because it, someone who's just walking in may not be know how to handle mm -hmm. uh, someone, handle criticisms of the church in this way. Um, but someone who has a solid, sound relationship with the Lord, I think we are called to, in the context of our relationship, to wrestle mm -hmm. with, with, with Scripture, in which he gives bucket loads of throughout. So like at no point is he saying something that he doesn't have solid scripture anger to. And so I think to give, I think people who have a solid sound relationship with the Lord um, should really look at this book and just to consider some things. Cause I, I think it caught, it drew some conviction from me. Um, Cause remember I said the two chapters I like was sacred, the other one was crucified. And crucified was talking about how our, uh, uh, our relationship with Christ cost our life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, 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 and when you consider grace and we consider that we did nothing and Jesus died for us. And so we, we share the true message of grace being free and like we didn't have to do anything to earn justification. But, but sanctification, that, 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 that the intention is, I mean, Jesus over and over says, you know, you have to pick up your cross and carry it. If you won't give up everything for my sake, if you, if you care so much about your life, you, you, you can't actually have a relationship with me if that's more important to you than having your relationship. You pretty much need to lay everything down. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that actually mean for each of us? It might look different for many of us, but, but like being able to wrestle with, lift up, really consider hear these things and be able to have a sober view of what he's saying um, and not look at it often as an indictment of everyone else because what he's really saying is we're all the church mm -hmm. and that we shouldn't be so bound to one person leading one person doing this that we ourselves have no depth of relationship or, or seeking the Lord our own so that we aren't growing the whole church should be growing as the body and sharing the giftings that God is giving each of us with the body of Christ that we all might grow so I think it's really a book for those who I think have a, a solid relationship with the Lord, um, staff or lay, and who just wants to wrestle with what does the church look like, what maybe it should look like, what maybe it shouldn't look like, and how do we engage that just in our own personal lives in a lot of ways, you know. Yeah, I would say no matter who you are, no matter what church you go to, I think this book is, you're going to have things that you agree, some mm -hmm. things that you disagree Agreed. with, but 
I, I think that's a wonderful exercise as a Christian. And that's why I really appreciate your caution about someone who's been a Christian for a while, someone who's thought through these things already before coming to it. I think, mm-hmm. I think that's a helpful caution in, in, in talking about uh, you know, a book like this. Unfortunately, that's really all the time we have. Fair. We've been talking to David Bowens about Francis Chan's book, Letters of the Church. I feel like we could fill easily you another really could. three minutes or an hour, <laughs> but I think that's just a, the testament to, to what, a, what a deep book this is, and, yeah. and, and hopefully it helps people just think through really important issues when it comes to, to what is the church and, and how can we make it, how can we conform it to the image that, that, that God wants it to. Uh, we really hope you have enjoyed this conversation. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to Orchard Hill Plus for more podcasts from Orchard Hill Church. Uh, if you really like, like this episode, we'd like, love for you to tell us by writing a review, writing a comment, and uh, uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, writing a review on Apple, Co- uh, Apple Podcasts. This really helps other people find this podcast platform. Uh, join us next month as we talk with Tyler Thomas about finding the gospel in fiction books. I'm Jonathan Thede, and this has been Best Books. See you next time.